Welcome to Hope Today. We hope you're having an outstanding day. We believe that you are promised a future and a hope, and we are trusting that God is gonna bring that hope to you today, bring that future to you starting today. I'm Tom Hollis. I'm here with Amy Schaefer. Hey! Hi, Sydney is uh, off today, so Amy, me and you. I know, you know what? <laughs> I just wanna encourage you with a little Frank Sinatra today. The best is yet to come in your life. The best is yet to come. Isn't that what hope is, Tom? It is believing that, that your best days are ahead of you, that God has something good for you today, that today could be the best day of your life. It's living in a place of joyful expectancy. It's not going to get worse and worse and worse. It's going to get better and better and better. I just want to know, can you do, I did it my way as well. I, mean, I don't know if that's a Christian well, that's song. that's the song they're singing in hell. <laughs> I did it my way. We just, I, I didn't know how far your Frank Sinatra repertoire because goes. Deep, yeah, because of my dad. Thank you, dad, for the deep Frank roots. Well, we have a, a, a wonderful verse that we, we really want to dig into today. First Peter chapter two, verses seven through nine. So. It says this, yes, you who trust him recognize the honor God has given him. But for those who reject him, the stone that the builders rejected has now become the cornerstone. And he is the stone that makes people stumble, the rock that makes them fall. They stumble because they do not obey God's word. And so they meet the fate that was planned for them. But you are not like that, for you are a chosen people. You are a royal priest, a holy nation, God's very own possession. As a result, you can show others the goodness of God, for he called you out of the darkness into his wonderful light. Well, there's a lot to unpack Woo! there. I like that because of what he's done, we can show the goodness of God to others. Yes. I love that. No, this scripture honestly is a game changer that if believers would know who they are in Christ, you're a chosen people. You're a royal priesthood. You're a holy nation. We are called out of darkness and into light. Mm -hmm. So there's no more who am I? What am I here for? What in the world was I born for? I'm not worth anything. I'm not worthy. I'm not valuable. This changes everything because you are hand picked, Tom, by God for his purposes, his work. So I just wonder today how you're feeling. Are you feeling, are you feeling like I know who I am today or I'm really struggling with this? And some people open the door to even depression. Depression is, is this overwhelming sense, but if you know who you are, you're, you're the head and not the tail. You're above only and not beneath. You're the victor. You can do all things through Christ, which strengthens you. I don't know where you're at today, but we are praying for you and we would love for you to give us a call and we would love to pray for you. We wanna see you win. Call us at 888-665-4483. You know, as I think about the word cornerstone, which yeah, is in there, I was drawn word. to that, a big word, yeah. the name of our ministry here, Cornerstone Television. And who is the cornerstone? Well, it's Christ. It's Christ. And you know, um, I was just talking with one of our pastors at church on Sunday, just chit-chatting before the service. And he mentioned cornerstone as another translation of that is the keystone yes. that, that holds the arch together. And if you have that, the arch doesn't even need, there doesn't, doesn't even need any cement in there. It'll stay together. But if you take that away, everything falls. And if you take Jesus out of the equation yeah. in our nation, mm -hmm. which we've done increasingly, things begin to fall. Wow. He is what holds us together. Well, and another word for cornerstone is just simply a rock. You know, like a rock, a steadiness, a firmness, a solidness that cannot be moved and cannot be shaken. That's why we, we build our house in the, in the Christian world upon the rock of our salvation. Yeah. We don't build our lives upon shifting and seeking sand. And here's the deep, you know, there's, there's the kingdom of heaven and the kingdom of earth. And we're operating right now on earth, but we build our life upon the principles of the kingdom of heaven. Right. So that's why we don't have to fall apart in culture when culture's falling apart, when culture is shifting, when nations are changing, when government is shifting. We don't have to fall apart because our lives are built upon the rock of our salvation. That is so good, Amy. That is what the church is built on. I remember seeing a, a church that had the cornerstone. They usually have the date on there, but this one church, I took a picture of it. It's in my phone somewhere. It says Christ. That's all nice. it said on it. Christ was yes. on the cornerstone. 
He is the cornerstone. He is the one that holds it all together. And we can all agree that in the current state of our nation, we need to get back to the foundations, don't we? Prayer, repentance, those foundational things. Well, our next guest is leading a call for us to return to the rock, literally Plymouth Rock, where the pilgrims landed and started what would become our nation. Pastor Carter Conlon is a general overseer of Times Square Church, and he joins us today to tell us how to join in. Pastor Carter, welcome to Hope Today. Thank you so much. It's a real pleasure to be with you today. Well, we're so glad to have you and you're having a, an outstanding uh, opportunity for a prayer meeting. How is it that you happen? I mean, I love going back to Plymouth Rock and I love the history of it and the spiritual connection there. How, is it ha how did it happen that you were able to have a prayer meeting there? Well, it was, it was August 2019. My wife and I were on the way home from our vacation in Eastern Canada. And on the way home, she had been reading a book called the, the Mayflower, and she asked me if we could stop in Plymouth to see Plymouth Rock. And uh, I wasn't even familiar with the history, uh, to be honest with you, because we are Canadian uh, by birth, and we came here in 1994. So I said, sure. So we stopped over in, in Plymouth, and we were sitting on a bench uh, above the, uh, the colonnade that houses this particular stone that they say the Plymouth's uh, brethren first stepped on. And uh, when we were sitting on the bench, I heard somebody call my name. And it was a young lady, and she was walking her dogs. And she said, is that you, Pastor Carter? And I said, yes, it is. I said, do I know you? And she said, no. But my husband, myself, my mom, my dad, and four other people, we've been joining with you in your worldwide prayer meeting in New York City for the last two years. And we've been praying with you every Tuesday night. And I said, well, that's, that's very nice. And uh, she said, my mom and dad own the house on the corner. Would you like to see it? I initially declined. I said, no, thank you. We're busy. We're on the way home, more or less. And, and, uh, but my wife is a history buff, and the house was built in 1790. And she said, I'd like to see it. So we went over to this house. And when we walked in, that's when the owner of the house told us the story. Uh, two years or so before, he had owned a contracting company, and the Lord, in prayer, told him to sell his company and go and buy this house that was for sale at this time in Plymouth and, and wait. Now, this house is built on the, on the foundation of the very first house that was ever built in America. It's called Lot Number 1 America. It was built there in 1790 uh, on the very foundation, the, the 40 by 40 square foot area, I guess it is, that housed the, that, that initial home where the uh, surviving pilgrims, about roughly 103, 104, landed in 1620, and the, more than half died that first year. The 51 that survived gathered in that house to pray. They had no strength, they had no power, they had little resource, they were surrounded by enemies, they had no go forward strategy. All they had was a promise from Jesus Christ that they were being taken to a land where they could worship freely and according to conscience. And so in their weakness, they prayed. So I was quite taken with the history of the house. I mean, there are diagrams inside that depict the first Thanksgiving as actually being in the front yard when you look out the window. And it was in that house that the first treaty with the Wampanoag Indian people and surrounding Native American tribes was, was also signed. So it's a significantly historic spot. So I just said, can we pray together? And uh, the owner told me, he said, we've been praying every Tuesday night. And uh, about two months ago, I started to pray and said, Lord, could you make a way that I could meet that man, referring to me as wow. the pastor of Times Square Church at that time. And so just a short time later, I'm sitting on a bench about 30 yards or so from his house. And so I knew that God had ordained this meeting. We prayed in the house for a, a season and there was such an undeniable presence of God. It was absolutely amazing. I went back to my hotel room that night and I, I couldn't sleep. And in the middle of the night, about three in the morning, I just started to pray. And I said, God, why did you lead me to this house? I didn't even know it existed. And it has such significance in the, in the history of this nation. So why did you lead me there to this place? And it was at that point that the Lord took me to Second Chronicles chapter 6 and chapter 7. I'll try to make this very quick. But in chapter 6, Solomon is dedicating the temple. And the temple, of course, represents God's a willingness to dwell among a certain people group that are set aside to bring glory to his name in the earth. He promised to be their God, and they promised to be his people. And um, 
of course, Solomon prays when he's dedicating the temple, and he, he prays something like this. He said, Lord, if your people sin against you and they're taken captive in a place near or far uh, from where we are today, and in that place of captivity, they come to themselves and they, they realize what they've left behind and they turn back towards this temple and pray. And Solomon says, hear their prayer and forgive their sin and basically bring them home. And then in chapter seven, in the middle of the night, the Lord appears to Solomon. And he says to Solomon, I've heard your prayer. I've heard your prayer. And if I have to send pestilence or if there's a, there's famine in the land or if an enemy rises up, that's where that famous verse comes from. If my people are called by my name, will humble themselves and pray, seek my face and turn from their wicked ways. I'll hear from heaven, forgive their sin and heal their land. And then he says something really profound. He says, now my eyes will be open and my ears will be listening for the prayer that is prayed in this place. And my heart, he said, will be there perpetually. In other words, if you stray from me, I will remember, I will still be here and I will remember the covenant that we made with each other in this place. I said I would be your God and you said you would be my people. It was at that point the Lord spoke to me and said, I want you to come back to the place. This spiritual foundation of America is in this house where they pray. I want you to come back there and I want you to ask for forgiveness on behalf of the nation for what you have done with the 400 years of freedom that I gave you. And so that's what this Plymouth prayer meeting is all about. That's how it came to pass. And that's what we're going to do. Now, not only asking for forgiveness, but we have people from every walk of life, but as I say, from senators to single moms, are going to be praying and asking for God's blessing on our families, our nation, our schools, our homes, uh, the civility in our cities, the respect for law and order. We're going, we have a uniformed policeman coming from New York City. So there's going to be people from every strata of life praying and asking for God's future blessing and a moment of mercy for the nation. So that's how this prayer meeting has started. Pastor, why do you think it is important to pray for those religious freedoms so that we can worship freely? And are those religious freedoms at stake? Well, of course they are. Anybody who's, uh, who's got a thinking mind knows that, that we, we are facing now what they were fleeing. Uh, they were fleeing being dictated to from from the top down in their uh, former societies as to what they could think, how they could act, what they could preach. And the dictates, of course, were, uh, were, were restricting the word of God and, and the practice of the Christian faith. So they, they were under a, a, a preaching, actually, uh, in the country they were in before they came here, uh, that where they believed that God had given them a promise that he was taking them to a nation that he was going to found as a place where the gospel could be propagated freely according to uh, the word of God and according to conscience. As a matter of fact, they made a, uh, a compact, it's called the Mayflower Compact, before they actually landed, that all the laws they would pass, all the governance they would do would be for the benefit of the whole society, you know, as America's theme has been out of many, one, and that the purpose of the founding of this new colony, as it is, was for the propagation of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Right. That's not even debatable. No matter what's taught in schools today, this is the actual cornerstone, as you say, of America. And we're going back to that cornerstone and just saying, God, forgive us. Lord, you gave us a land where we could worship freely. Yes. And and we, we as other societies did throughout history, and as Israel once did, or more than once did, we just, we just became enamored with ourselves and our own freedom, and we forgot who you are and what our purpose was. Mm -hmm. And so we're simply going back in obedience to God. And I believe, as we do what he's asking us to do, that it's in his heart to show us a moment of mercy. Amen. If, I, if I might say for just a moment that in the book of Ezekiel, God shows Ezekiel in a certain chapter the, the absolute moral and spiritual rot of the nation. It was top to bottom in a certain portion of, of Ezekiel. And when you look at it, you say, surely the nation is, is under the judgment of God. But then he says something incredible. He says, and I sought for a man to stand in the gap and make up the head so that I should not have to judge the nation. But I found none. So this, this moment of mercy was in the heart of God. Mm -hmm. He just simply couldn't find anybody to agree with him. It, mm -hmm. it was that simple. So we're, we're going to Plymouth, not just to hang our heads and weep, but we're going there in agreement to the reality that we believe that God's 
heart is to give America another spiritual awakening. That, that's my Amen. heart. That's why prayer is breaking out all over the country now. Amen. That, that is uh, it's an exciting prospect. And as, as I've studied uh, moves of God historically, repentance is always a part of that. Personal repentance, pretty much. So people repent of their sins. What, what do you see as the national repentance that's needed right now? Well, I'm going to talk about a lot of things. Um, I mean, we are a, a, a terribly backslidden nation, but we did some things right from the, the foundation of the nation that we need to talk about. For example, God gave us freedom as a people, and we turned around and made slaves of an entire race of people mm -hmm. with our freedom. And even worse, in some parts of the country, we did it in the name of God. Mm -hmm. I, I was reading the biography of Frederick, Frederick Douglass, mm -hmm. the great abolitionist, and I when he was four years old, he was uh, told a story in his biography of a plantation owner coming home, gathering all the slaves in their quarters and talking about the great revival that had just touched their town and was touching their church. He was there every night, how the Holy Spirit is falling on everybody and touching everybody's life. And then Frederick watched the same man beat his mother almost to death for forgetting some menial. He hung her by the rafters by her hands and beat her back with a rod until she was almost dead for forgetting to do some menial task that she was given to do throughout the day. And Frederick Douglass at four years of age curled up in fear in the corner of this cabin. He said, whoever this white man's God is, is not God. And actually he was right. This man's God was not God. And the abject ignorance of doing these things in the name of God is a great sin, not just against a race of people, but it's a great sin against the name of God himself who gave us the freedom. We've got to go back we have to deal honestly with this sin. And then we've got to ask God for the grace to bring healing to these wounds that are still bleeding in our streets even today. And I happen to believe that he can, and only he can. Yes. We can put together all the commissions we want. We can talk to, we're blue in the face, but it's only the spirit of God that can give us the ability to forgive and the benevolence yeah. to care. This, yeah. is, this is what I believe. And this is where we're gonna begin and we're gonna go from there. Pastor Carter, is this a mercy moment for America? Yes, it is, if we can hear it. Mm -hmm. That's the key. I mean, God wanted to give mercy to Israel, but there was nobody could hear it. I mean, he said, I sought for somebody. I couldn't find anybody. Can you imagine that? The most religious nation on the face of the entire planet, and nobody can hear the voice of God. And they've all got their scriptures to talk about why God should send judgment to the nation. But in spite of all the noise that's going on in that time, and in our time, there is this small, still voice that comes through the, all of the crowd saying, I want to show mercy yes. to my people once yes. again, or to the people of the nation yes. once again. And I'm hoping with all my heart that we can hear that. That's, that's the core, it's the center core of why God is calling this prayer. He didn't call it just to rub our faces in our sin. Mm -hmm. He called it so that we could have an honest face-to-face -face dealing with him. And with that honest face-to-face mm -hmm. -face dealing, he could now uh, show a moment of mercy to the nation. Amen. So if someone wants to join in, how can someone who's not going to be able to go to Plymouth, how can someone join in to the, with this uh, prayer meeting? Well, firstly, I don't recommend anybody go to Plymouth. We can only hold 27 people in the house. <laughs> so they're, they're going to end up in the outside no matter what happens. But you can go to our website, Times Square Church, New York City. It's tsc.nyc. And that would be Tuesday night, October 6th. 7 to 9 p.m. Eastern Time. It's our regular worldwide prayer meeting that is now in 209 countries. It's, a, it's an interactive prayer meeting. People can text in, they can email in their prayer requests, and we can actually speak directly to people in other parts of the world during that prayer meeting. Or they can go to It's Time to Pray, one word, all lowercase, It's Time to Pray dot org, and the instructions will be there. Uh, we're using the same company that uh, Jonathan Kahn used in. Um, in uh, Washington for the return. So the instructions will be there as to uh, what is the best avenue to get in if, if they're having difficulty connecting on their cell phones in particular. We are looking forward to that. And we're gonna have all of the details for that event on our website. Pastor Ken, as we're just exiting this moment, will you pray uh, for our nation and pray for um, our country and for the mercy of God? to come back to America and that we will remember our roots. Father, in Jesus' name, Lord, we just lift up our nation before you. And we do, we do, Lord, admit 
that we've fallen far from our purpose. Yes, we've fallen far from loving you. God, we're, we, we've fallen far from even caring about the next generation. We, we do so many things that are an abomination in your sight, but yet it's in your heart to show us mercy. It's in your heart, God. You, you even sent a prophet to Nineveh, a wicked city that had never even heard your name and were known for cruelty, and yet you showed mercy for a whole generation. You've done it in ages past in other societies and other places. And you, Lord, remember, you remember the tears that were shed in this nation. You remember every knee that was ever bowed throughout our history. You remember the 51 emaciated, half-starved pilgrims who prayed in that house and asked you for a miracle and for a place where you could be worshipped freely and according to conscience. And you hear every tear of every person, every single parent, everyone in the nation who cries out for freedom for their children. God, you hear the sigh and cry of every teenager who doesn't seem to know what the future holds and how they're going to find their way through it. And so, Lord, we're appealing to your mercy. My God, have mercy on our government, have mercy on our courts, have mercy on our schools, our families, our homes, our nation. Lord Jesus Christ, we put it all in your hands. And we come, and as the script, as the song says, in, in my hand, no price I bring, simply to thy cross I cling. We come to you. And we thank you that you are a great and a merciful God. And we thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. And Father, we just take yes. this moment to pray for Pastor Carter, yes. Pastor Carter Conlon, and uh, the, those that will join together t on Tuesday. We ask, Father, that uh, their prayers will ascend to heaven yes. and begin the healing of our land, Father. Help us to repent and come to the place of mercy for our nation. Yes. Bless this meeting as they, uh, as they participate in it. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Thank you so much, Pastor, for being with us today. Thank you so much for what you're doing for the nation. God bless you and thank you so much. We'll be back with more Hope Today right after this. We always like to begin with the Word of God because it is the power unto salvation. We're called to shine the light of Jesus so others will know about Christ because now more than ever, people really need to know who Jesus is. Christ is in you. Our world needs hope like never before. But lives change for the better when hope breaks through. This October, help us light up our city with the truth and hope of the gospel. Alongside special guests, Joan Hunter, Mike Smalley, Pat Schatzline, Keenan Bridges, and Real Talk Kim. Save the date for our Hope Breaks Through broadcast, October 12th through 16th at 8 p.m. on Cornerstone Television Network. tomorrow's Hope Today, what Jesus really said about social justice and economics. Author and economic advisor Jerry Boyer reveals the fight between the maker versus the takers. Don't miss tomorrow's Hope Today. What an awesome program today has been. I mean, we started off talking about Jesus being the cornerstone, being the rock. And then we go all the way to talking about the Plymouth Rock, really, and that whole area where it all started. And, and he referenced the return, which was yeah. just in Washington, D.C., which I attended the return and the Franklin Graham prayer walk. And to watch how God is moving in our nation as far as prayer is concerned. It is time for the people of God, the chosen people, the holy nation, right. the ones called out of darkness into light, to pray and to stand in the gap. Tom, if we don't stand in the gap, who will? Well, uh, Pastor Carter mentioned that verse where God looked for someone to stand in the gap and couldn't find someone to stand in the gap. We need to be those people. We need to say, I'm here, Lord. I'm praying for our nation. Yes. You know, there's something interesting, Amy, about going to a location, going to yes. Washington, D.C., like you did. Yeah. Is God limited by time and space? No, he can answer our prayers anywhere. 
But there's something significant about certain places, and Plymouth Rock is certainly one of those. Uh, he mentioned the Mayflower Compact and how the pilgrims, even before they set foot on the land, they dedicated this land to the Lord, are one of our most foundational documents, the Mayflower Compact. And I, I just think today, as I'm sure you're gonna pray for America, what is God, we talked about repentance and we talked about a renewing of our nation, but what is God saying to you? Where, where has your relationship with the Lord faltered? If it has, and maybe it hasn't, praise the Lord. But if it has, God's offering mercy. He's offering restoration. I love Amy, restoration. In the yes. Bible I have highlighted in pink, God's restoration. It's all over my Bible, yeah. you know, because God loves to do that. Isn't that what he's all about? Taking that which is old and torn and broken and restoring, redeeming it, bringing it back to its beautiful, perfect position Amen. in life. And that's exactly what God is doing in your life right now. We're praying, we're standing in the gap with you and for you, for your sons, for your daughters, for your, for your marriage, for your, for your business, your life and your career. God wants to redeem the time and the chaos that the enemy has stolen from your life. We have to draw a line in the sand. And even as a country before this, we draw a line in the sand and we pray. And when we pray, God hears us, he answers us. God wants the best. He wants to pour out his mercy. And it says that there will be times of refreshing, refreshing that will come. And somebody out there right now, that is ministering to you. When I say that times of refreshing, think about this, the, 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 the water, of Christ yes. washing over you, bringing that time of refreshing. Yes. Let's pray together. Yes. Father, we just come before you with all the requests that have come into the, the prayer ministry, Lord. There are so many that have called and they've been prayed for, Lord, but we wanna lift them up again and say, Father, meet their needs. Bring those times of, refresh, of refreshing to anybody that is struggling, Lord, in their relationship, in their life, in their spiritual purpose, bring times ref refreshing and mercy to them yes. now in Jesus name. name. Amen. 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 The best truly is yet to come in your life. Times of refreshing. They're not only coming, they're here now. So just go back to the rock that is higher than I go back to the rock to where our nation was founded. Find strength and hope and courage. And let Christ be the cornerstone for you. He is that cornerstone. He is the one that if you have your feet firmly planted on him, you will not be swayed by anything that's going on around you. And you know what? You're going to find God's hope today too.